Hello, everybody, <clears throat> and welcome to Chapter 9. And in Chapter 9, we're going to look more on those business cycles we spoke about. Also, what is unemployment in an economic sense? And finally, inflation. So this is going to be some very pertinent stuff to what you've been seeing lately on the news pertaining to unemployment and inflation numbers. And we're going to go through how all of this is computed and looked at economically. So we're going to look at what is known as a business cycle. What is unemployment and how is it considered in an economic sense? Inflation and its effects. What are the downsides of inflation? And finally, does inflation affect output? So remember, we touched upon a business cycle due to the fact that prices are not flexible on the way down, but fairly fixed, we have business cycles. And in a business cycle, we have periods of a peak or the top of the cycle where the economy is booming, then the economy starts slowing down and eventually hits a recession, bottoms out in a trough, and then starts growing again. So no economy has continuous growth forever. All real economies are going to look something like this with periods of business cycles. So as you can see here, we have a peak, a trough, the next peak, the next trough, and then the next peak. And the overall trend is growth. The overall trend is growth, but there are periods of growth and contraction, but over enough time, the economy is growing. That's how real world economies look. And recessions aren't something that we can, we should always melt down about. They're a normal part of the economy. Recessions like we saw in 2008 or something like the Great Depression, that is not normal. So recessions should not be horribly severe, but they should exist because they're just part of a normal business cycle. And this is a list of recessions up to the Great Recession in 2008-09. As you can see, that one lasted a year and a half and was a very, very severe one, 4.3% decline. But many recessions are very minor. If you look here, some 1%, 0.2, 0 0.4, most recessions are not that severe. And you could argue we are currently in a recession, or at least were, and are teetering on going back into one, because the actual definition is two quarters of negative growth. So what causes business cycles? And remember, we looked at this previously. Economic shocks are the catalyst. When something unexpected happens, think of what we saw after COVID, for instance. We have big shocks to either supply, demand, or both. Then remember for most products, especially consumer ones, prices are sticky on the way down. You can always raise your price, but you can't just keep cutting them and eventually you'll hit a point where you can't cut them anymore. So if you can't change your price, what happens? Demand is going to cause less sales. Demand's gonna drop off, there'll be less sales, there'll be inventory piling up and you'll get a recession. Eventually, once the inventory starts piling up, firms will cut back production, GDP will fall, because what is GDP? GDP is a function of production. So since production is going to fall, well, what will happen then is, well, what will happen then is the economy will contract and you'll be in a recession. So um, inflexible prices are thought to be a major factor in preventing the economy from quickly adjusting to shocks. And we'll look at some of the shocks on the next slide. So shocks are generally the catalyst for a recession, then the fact that prices are sticky on the way down kicks it off and then the rest of it happens. So what can cause these shocks? Well, we touched upon them recently and we recently lived through one with the pandemic, but causes can be anything from political events, so uh, upheaval in a country, for instance, financial instability, that's what happened in 2008, that recession, the whole banking system almost collapsed, irregular innovation, Remember, technology comes in waves, and when the technologies aren't being invented regularly, you'll get periods of much less growth. That could cause a shock. Productivity changes, um, that can happen as well. So anything that would cause rapid changes in productivity, less or more, that could cause a shock. And finally, monetary factors as well. If there is too much money, if there's inflation, which has been happening right now, that can hurt the economy. And we're gonna to touch on this in a little bit when we look at inflation. So what actually gets hurt the most in the trough of a business cycle? Well, durable goods usually get hammered most. 
So expensive durable goods, why? Durable goods are something designed to last three years or more. So by their nature, they are long lasting. In bad economic times, people are gonna be a lot less likely to replace their car or replace their appliances. When the ones they have, they might be old, they might need maintenance or something like that, but they may be able to keep them for a long period of time. So if your durable goods are still usable, you're probably not going to replace them if we are in a situation where the economy is doing poorly. Uh, so capital goods, businesses aren't really going to invest in new capital goods. If the economy is doing badly, you're going to probably not buy new vehicles or factory equipment or any of that. Um, consume, you'll probably put it off until the economy does better. And consumer durables such as your car or your washing machine, same thing here. Non-durable goods are generally affected less. Food and clothing, you need them regardless of how well the economy is doing. You might buy cheaper brands, but you're still going to buy roughly the same amounts. Services don't get hit anywhere near as much as well. Once again, we generally need them. So that's what we see in business cycles. So durable goods and capital goods usually get hammered by far the most in bad economic times. Now we're gonna go into unemployment in an economic sense. One, the first thing we need to consider about unemployment is the following. When we talk about the unemployment rate, we're talking about the percentage of the workforce who is unemployed. Being unemployed in a literal sense and being unemployed in an economic sense are two very different points. In an economic sense, to be unemployed, what it means is you want a job, but don't have one. So children are technically unemployed, but they don't count in an economic sense. Retirees are technically unemployed, but they don't count in an economic sense. Someone who is not actively looking for a job for any reason does not count. Full-time students, for instance, someone who legally cannot work, none of them count towards the unemployment rate. So to count towards unemployment economically, two things must happen. You need to want a job, but not have one, and also be able to work. So if we look here at our first category, this purple box here does not count towards unemployment. Under 16 or institutionalized, be it in something like a prison or anything like that, they're not able to work legally. Not in the labor force. So this could be anything from retirees, full-time students, people who just are no longer working or choose not to work. Those people do not count either. Both the purple and orange categories, they're unemployed in the literal sense, but they are not unemployed economically. Now, in this part here, this is our labor force, or the people who are eligible to work in our country. About one half of the population as of 2018 are 163.2 million. Of them, 156.9 million of them are employed or working, and 6.3 million are unemployed. So only this little red slice at the very bottom is who is unemployed in an economic sense. Although the first two boxes are people who aren't working and literally unemployed, they don't count as economically unemployed. So the unemployment rate is literally of the workforce, that 163.2 million, how many people of them are currently unemployed? That's the number you see get published. That is the unemployment rate in the country. Now the unemployment rate, just like GDP, is not a perfect metric. And the reason it's not a perfect metric are twofold. Number one, involuntary part-time workers are counted uh, as employed. So let's say you had a full-time job working for a company. You made $80,000 a year, you worked 45 hours a week, and let's say your company is doing very poorly and cuts your hours back and now you're only working 20 hours a week. You're a part-time employee and you're making less than half of what you used to. You do not count as unemployed, even though you are greatly underemployed. So once again, someone who loses a job as a corporate executive and is now making ends meet working in a Starbucks, they don't count as unemployed either because literally they have a job. So the unemployment rate doesn't take into account people who lost one type of a job and are now vastly underemployed. The unemployment rate also doesn't count the second category, discouraged workers. So if you're out of a job for so long, you give up and say, I'm done, I'm not even gonna bother working, you now no longer count towards the unemployment rate. Because remember, to count towards unemployment, you have to want to have a job, but be out of work. If you no longer want to have a job because you've just given up trying to find one, well, in a twist of fate, you now no longer count as unemployed. 
So that is another big criticism of the unemployment rate as well. So in this case, discouraged workers, if you see that start ticking up or you start seeing uh, people who are forced to work part-time instead of full-time, if you see that ticking up as well, well, in both of those cases, well, um, it's a bad warning sign for the economy, but neither of them are counted in unemployment. Unemployment has three different types, and you'll certainly see some of these types on uh, homework and exam questions. So of the three types, up first is what is known as frictional unemployment. And frictional unemployment are individuals searching for jobs or waiting to take them soon. So to be frictionally unemployed is a good thing in the economy. You're always going to have people who are frictionally unemployed. If you quit your job because you hate it and you want a new one, you're frictionally unemployed. If you graduate from college and start looking for a job, you're frictionally unemployed. That's not a bad thing. It means there's mobility in your economy, that people can leave jobs they don't like or aren't a good fit and find a different one. You will always have frictional unemployment. The biggest takeaway is this. When we say that a company or, excuse me, a country has full employment, it doesn't mean their entire workforce has a job because that is not possible. You're always going to have people quitting jobs every day and getting new ones. There's always going to be at least someone unemployed at any point in time in a society. So to keep that in mind, it is impossible to have completely 0% unemployment. Structural unemployment, once again, it's not necessarily a good thing, but it is a fact of life in any society. That is changes in the structure of demand for labor. Let's say you were the world's greatest VCR manufacturer. If your company goes out of business because no one wants VCRs, well, now you're structurally unemployed. Structural unemployment, once again, generally happens when skills become obsolete or jobs change geographic locations. If your company offshores your position to India, that's an example of structural unemployment as well. It's not necessarily a good thing, but it is always present in society in some capacity. And when someone's structurally unemployed, what do they usually have to do? They usually have to um, retrain and get a new job um, doing something else, something similar or different. So one and two, frictional and structural, you're always going to have to a degree in a society. <clears throat> the third part <clears throat> of unemployment is the one we become very concerned with especially during recessions, and that's known as cyclical unemployment. Cyclical unemployment is caused by recessions. Your company starts doing very poorly because the economy is doing very poorly and lays you off. That's an example of being cyclically unemployed. And when you start seeing the unemployment rate tick up from where it normally is, that's generally a sign of a large amount of cyclical unemployment and something that is very negative towards society as a whole. So cyclical unemployment is caused by recessions and cyclical unemployment is the one we really worry about when an economy is doing poorly. So full employment, remember, you can never have the entire workforce employed at any one point in time. So full employment in an economic sense is some measure of where we expect our unemployment rate to be. In the United States, it's generally around 4% unemployment at any given time is what we would consider full employment or the natural rate of unemployment, NRU. So the natural rate of unemployment, what that means is the amount of unemployment you expect to see at any given time. It's not possible to have 100% of your workforce employed. It can vary over time due to demographic changes, changing job search methods, public policy changes, and actual employment can at points go above or below the NRU. The NRU is a metric we come up with, but we consider that the full employment level of unemployment or the normal amount of unemployment we would expect there to be in the economy at any one point. When unemployment starts going above that NRU, that is a sign of a recession and bad economic times. So what are the costs of unemployment? Unemployment over the norms is going to hammer GDP. And GDP gap is your actual GDP minus its potential. Potential GDP is if we do everything perfectly efficiently and we have full employment, what the theoretical maximum GDP of our country can be. Actual GDP is what we calculate it at. And that can be negative or even positive at points. Because remember, it is possible to go above your full, uh, excuse me, below your full employment level of unemployment. But it's generally not sustainable, and we'll get into this in a minute. Oaken's Law is important. Every additional 1% of cyclical unemployment or 1% of unemployment above the norm creates a 2% hit to GDP. So it hammers GDP if you have a large amount of unemployment, and that's what we saw 
after the severe recession in 2008. So if we look here, these are some GDP gaps, both positive and negative. The positive ones are generally short-lived because it's generally not something sustainable to employ more people than you should. That's usually a sign of an overheated economy or inflation, and we'll get into that in a little bit, but it is possible for a short period of time. And negative GDP gaps, well, what that means is you have a high amount of unemployment, and if we look at the chart on the right, that's what it's showing. So in the periods right after 2008, we had a very, very large GDP gap because we had very, very severe unemployment. Unemployment does not have equal burdens. Depending on your job is going to determine if you're gonna get unemployed or not. Usually less educated workers get hit the most. Younger workers get hit a lot more than older ones, especially very young. So teenagers are by far the highest of, unemployed, of the unemployed. Um, it can vary due to race and eth ethnicity as well. Gender, it's usually about the same. Male and female unemployment is usually very close depending on what fields are getting hit. And we'll look at that on the next page. Education, the more educated you are, generally the less likely you will become unemployed. Uh, lower educated workers are usually the first to go. And the long-term unemployment rate is usually much lower than the overall. Unemployment's computed as a snapshot using a sample of people. And the long-term unemployment rate is a lot less than people who are unemployed for less than 15 weeks. So if we look here, um, this is just a breakdown. So before the recession, during unemployment doubled from 4.6 to 9.3 percent. And then in 2018, it came back down to around 4.1. So it took a long time uh, to come back to normal. And then it shot up again during COVID and then it's back down. I believe it's currently under 4 percent. But as you can see during the recession, some groups got hammered more, um, construction fields really got hammered, and that's why you saw more unemployed men than women, because that field skews overwhelmingly male. African American unemployment got hit more than um, white unemployment during the recession to a degree, uh, if we look here, but everybody did tick up. Uh, more men were unemployed than women, and as you can see, the people with less than a high school diploma got hammered by far more than ones with better degrees, such as a high school or college degree. And that 15-week number, that even ticked up massively during 2009 as well. So unemployment's not consistent over demographic and geographic changes, but this is just an example of what we saw in the recession and immediately after. So that's what we're looking at here. And teenagers by far have the greatest unemployment during the recessions, as you can see with these numbers right here. Generally, they're considered expendable and the first to, to go. It's easier to fire a teenager who has an extra job to make some extra money than it is to fire someone with kids or that is supporting a family or a spouse or anything like that. What are the costs of unemployment? Well, the costs of unemployment are, are many fold. So loss of skills and self-respect, the longer someone is out of work, the more their skills are going to degrade or they'll become just not um, really open to finding something else. That's very difficult. Plummeting morale. So if people start seeing their coworkers being fired, it's going to cause the morale of your existing employees to drop and the morale of society in general if people are greatly losing their jobs. So that's a problem there. Uh, family disintegration, poverty and reduced hope. So unemployment is very bad in a society. Heightened racial and ethnic tensions. Generally societies that are highly employed and the economy is doing well usually don't lead to unrest and uh, both civil and political and all of that stuff. Uh, suicide, homicide, health problems, and it can lead to violent social and political change as well. Once again, violent overthrows of governments usually don't happen in healthy uh, economic societies. Now we're going to look at inflation, and inflation is something that has been all over the news, and inflation is the rise in prices over time. And why is inflation bad? Because inflation reduces the purchasing power of money. So it is calculated via CPI, and CPI is where they take a price of goods, of various products, in a year we're interested in, 
and then divide by a base year. So in this case, they were using 1982 to 1984 as the base year, and I believe 2018, uh, 2017, excuse me, uh, of the current year. And what you get is a calculated metric. And it'll give you the change in prices over that period of time. The one on the bottom, this is a typo. This is 2017 to 2018. There was a 2.4% rise in prices. Now, inflation has been quite a bit higher recently. At one point, it hit almost 10%, and it's currently significantly above where it should be. It's around 6 to 8%, given the metrics being coming out right now. And we're going to go through all of the problems that inflation can cause. And what does it actually do? Well, it reduces the purchasing power of your money. If everything becomes more expensive, your money is technically worth less. That is what we mean by inflation. And here's inflation up to 2018. In the 1970s, it really spiked well into the double digits, but it has been ticking up again. And as of last year, inflation was getting quite high again, nearing 10%. And we'll go into what actually caused this. On this chart here is just inflation rates among some developed nations. So inflation can take two forms, and we actually have been experiencing both due to the policies that came out after the pandemic. So demand pull inflation is something we've definitely been dealing with, and that's excessive spending relative to output or too much money in the economy. What happened during COVID? Think of all of those rounds of relief money, the money given out to businesses and money given out to people, those COVID relief checks. It injected tons more money into the economy. So demand pull inflation is generally called too much spending chasing too few goods. If everybody now has additional money, they're now going to have more demand for goods and services. But if the amount of goods and services really aren't changing, what you're going to wind up in is a situation where prices of everything go up. Remember, additional demand and no change in quantity is going to raise the price. So it's just the law of supply and demand. And we've certainly been experiencing that due to all of that COVID money. That's causing some of the inflation. The other one is cost push, and that is due to supply shocks. We've been experiencing this as well. Think of all of the supply chain breakdowns we saw during COVID. The computer chip shortage and all of those other things we've been running into. In that case, that is a cause of cost push inflation. Your inputs become more expensive. So let's say we own a pizza place and our flour is more expensive, our tomatoes are more expensive, our cheese is more expensive. What are we gonna do? We're gonna raise our prices and pass it on to our consumers. We're not gonna just eat the price increases and lose money. So it's going to cause the cost of everything to raise down the line. That's cost push inflation. And both of these have been going on at the same time recently. So it can be different to distinguish between the types of inflation and once again they can also be happening at the exact same time and they generally differ in sustainability demand pull will usually continue as long as the excess spending continues and that's something that's still going on our government is still continuously spending money and we'll go into later chapters when we get into chapters 14 15 and 16 some of the policies we can do to rein this in but that's what will generally cause demand pull to continue. Cost push generally ends in a recession. Things get so expensive that people start buying less of them. Output drops, you get a recession. Once you get a recession, the prices will eventually come back down. So generally inflation does lead to a recession. And inflation, depending on what is going on, prices for things like food and energy, like gasoline and oil, those can swing really fast, but not necessarily be sustained swings. So they also report something called core inflation, which is without food and energy goods and focusing on just consumer products and stuff like that. When this starts going up, you really have a problem with inflation and that's been going on lately. Core CPI has been rising. And as a consequence, that's how we've really noticed that we've been dealing with a large amount of inflation. So the limitations and problems of inflation. Your nominal income is your paycheck, unadjusted for inflation. So let's say our paycheck from last year to this year is the same, but inflation was really high. It was like 8%. In reality, we got an 8% pay cut. Even though on paper we're making the same amount, everything cost 8% more than it did last year. So the problem with inflation is it makes money worth less. 
and your real income, just like real GDP, is nominal income adjusted for inflation. And the problem is, if your income doesn't keep up with inflation, if you don't have a raise built in or you don't get a change in your salary, you're in essence making less even though your paycheck hasn't changed. So the percentage change in real income is your change in your nominal income minus change in prices. And if you have a lot of inflation, in reality, it's like you're losing money. Everything costs more than it did last year and your paycheck doesn't go as far. So people who really get hurt by inflation, anybody with a, fi with a fixed income, so your income is not changing due to inflation or over time, so it could be people on some sort of um, pension or people whose, once again, salaries don't change due to inflation or over time. Well, your real income there is falling. People who save actually get hurt by inflation because your savings are worth less over time than when you save them. And if you're not getting a lot of interest on them, you actually could be losing money just having your money saved. Or if you have cash in a drawer, it's becoming worth less over time. As for people who borrow money, they do well, but the creditors get hurt. So if I lend $100,000 as a mortgage and there's terrible inflation, they're gonna still pay back my $100,000 at whatever interest rate I loaned it at. But if inflation goes over the interest rate, in essence, they're paying you back in cheaper dollars and it's like they're getting a discount on the money they borrowed. The money they pay you back is worth less than the money they borrowed. And if inflation is greater than the interest you charge them, you're actually losing money. You're getting paid back less than you lent. So creditors get hurt by inflation. People who really get unaffected or even helped, anybody on fixed income that can adjust. So a COLA is what is known as a cost of living increase. A lot of union jobs have these baked in. So every year you get a 3% raise or a 5% raise. As long as that's greater than inflation or at the same level, inflation's not gonna hurt you. However, if inflation goes above your co cost of living increase or adjustment, it's gonna hurt you as well. People on social security don't get hurt by inflation because social security is an automatic cost of living uh, increase that is tied to the inflation rate. Union members, once again, not as much because generally their contracts do um, keep up with inflation, but if inflation goes over the norm, like we've seen lately, they can get hurt as well. And people who borrow money because you're paying back your loan in cheaper dollars. So borrowers are helped by inflation, uh, lenders are hurt by it. So generally, we try to anticipate inflation in the interest rates that we see. When you take out a home loan, part of it is the regular interest rate, and another part of it is adjusting for inflation. So your real interest rate is the part of the rate adjusted for inflation. The nominal is what you and I pay if we borrow money, and that's got the inflation premium built in. So if we look here, here's an example of an interest rate. The interest rate here is 11%. 5% of it is the actual rate of return, so the bank is gonna really wanna make 5% on their money. The other 6% is to keep up with the rate of inflation. So the 6% inflation premium is gonna match the inflation. The additional 5% is the profit to the bank. No interest rate would just simply be the inflation premium because that would mean the bank isn't actually making any money. They're just making enough money to keep up with inflation. So any interest rate you pay has both parts baked into it, a real rate and an inflation premium. Other issues with inflation, well, um, deflation is the opposite of inflation. Generally during recessions, we can see it. We saw some deflation in 2008, 2009. Deflation is simply negative inflation. Prices are going down and your money is becoming worth more. In the past, it was more common than, uh, the, than the present, but um, the effects are the reverse of inflation. And generally we can still see it during severe recessions. And you can have mixed effects during times of inflation. People's incomes may go up, uh, fixed asset values may fall, and things like for people who have fixed rate mortgages, it helps borrowers. Your debt is going down. You're paying back cheaper and cheaper dollars. And the key thing is it's arbitrary. But for the overall economic health, high inflation is very harmful. So for overall health of the economy, high inflation is harmful. So does it affect output? Well, cost push inflation absolutely affects output. 
Cost push inflation causes prices to go up due to inputs becoming more expensive. By rule, if your inputs are becoming more expensive, once again, by rule, if your inputs are getting more expensive, well, what is going to happen? It's going to reduce your output. So if your inputs are getting more expensive, it's gonna reduce your output and reduction of output is what causes a recession and a drop in GDP. Demand pull inflation, well, there are different views here. One is that zero is best. Another is the view taken currently by our Federal Reserve that mild inflation around 2% is best. And we'll go into all of that in later chapters. However, when inflation gets bad, it turns into this. And what we're gonna end our last two slides on is something known as hyperinflation. And hyperinflation is rapid, extraordinary inflation to the tune of thousands of percent or more. Hyperinflation is inflation of more than 50% one per one month, which translates to an effective rate of at least 13,000% a year. And we've seen hyperinflation far more than this. It causes the full destruction of an economy. Most recently, you, uh, you might have seen in about 2008, Zimbabwe had hyperinflation and they released the $100 trillion bill. The $100 trillion bill, by the time it was removed from circulation, was worth less than a quarter. It was worth less than 23 US cents. So hyperinflation is where your money is becoming incredibly worthless in an incredibly rapid amount of time. It causes the complete destruction of an economy. So after World War I Germany, due to the Treaty of Versailles, they tried to print their way out of debt and caused hyperinflation. There are pictures from 1920s Germany of people literally burning money in their furnaces because it was cheaper than buying firewood. Japan saw this after World War II. And hyperinflation is generally pretty brief. Uh, the government expands the money supply too much, the money starts becoming worthless, and then eventually the entire banking system of the country collapses as a consequence. So hyperinflation is very, very bad, and it causes the complete destruction of an economy. People don't know what to charge because the money is changing value so fast. Consumers don't know what to pay. The banking system collapses. No one continues to make investments because you have no idea. Uh, there's no point making loans if your money is becoming so worthless. And uh, basically the entire economy ceases to exist. It forces the economy back to a barter system or they have to adopt another currency or gold or anything like that and eventually you will get economic collapse. The end of hyperinflation is economic collapse. It usually burns incredibly fast but it will burn itself out very quickly because the entire economy will come down as a consequence. And finally the job market's been slow to recover after the severe recession from 2007 to 2009 and we've had more openings than people employed. That's been an issue. So you could argue there's a skills mismatch for many reasons. A lot of companies failed at that time and people don't have skills to slide into anywhere else. There's also been a decrease in non-collegiate education like tech schools and stuff like that, which is a big problem. There's demographic and geographic issues. A lot of people aren't as willing to move as they were in the past for jobs. Not as bad of a problem since COVID with all the rise of telecommuting, but it'll always be a problem. And this one is very big. And if you've ever applied for an entry level job, you've run into this unrealistic expectations of employers. So people wanting five years of experience for an entry level job or uh, degrees where they're not needed, that's something that has to change as well. So we've seen slow recovery after that severe recession and not so much lately, uh, unemployment has come down but these are all problems that are going to dog us for the foreseeable future, especially with the rise of all of these new technological tools that are coming out, which uh, may render a lot more people's jobs obsolete as well. So it's something to keep in mind, and that's what I'm going to leave you on at the end of chapter nine.